So um, without further ado, um, I, I want to introduce the man who's uh, who has redone his abstract more times than any speaker we've ever had. <laughs> Thank you for that. You're all you're all too easy. This is an easy help. So um we must be okay. talk and I'll fix it. Yeah, I'll patter. Um uh it's gonna start off funky because I'll be switching between um keynote and Google for YouTube and whatnot. So bear with us. Um thank you. Thank you, Ted. Thank you, Kai, thank you, the other lab, thank you all for coming. And um uh I am gonna show a lot of stuff. It's in several all right. Oh, good. Ah, let's see if this works. Oh, and, and you don't need this one. No, I don't. Yeah. And in fact, that's been producing an echo, I hear, right? Okay. Okay. So are we okay? We're okay. Uh, okay. I'd like to start with something uh, that's sort of funny and sort of useless. Um, and it's a three minute, a uh, very old. Um, video excerpt. So I assume it's, uh, hang on. Um, obvious for everybody here that that was a total hack. And it was uh, 1990 and the students went out and bought welder goggles and you know gloves and stuff like that. And, um, uh, and it was shown at Sikai nationally back then. Um, and, um, uh, at one point around then, I was on a panel for the uh, Travel and Tourism Research Association, which, which is really a trade, you know, convention of mi middle managers. And I was on a VR panel with Timothy Leary, who, you know, kind of folded himself into the VR world. It was quite delightful. And I had to follow him. And he was going on and on. This stuff is coming next year. It's coming in two years. And, and I played that and I looked out at the audience and they were not technical people and it was clear that they thought this was all real, you know? And, and I had, you know, the unenviable task of saying, this is fake, this is fake. This is like art students kind of showing ironies and potentials here. Uh, it was kind of interesting. And um, uh, PS, what the fuck San Francisco Art Institute I, I needed to put that in. Uh, why is it that something like this could be recognized at a SIG Chi and a SIG Graph and it doesn't exist today? It might or might not come back. Okay, enough of that politics. Like being there, understanding mediated presence. Um, so these are three funny words because like is almost like a recursive metaphor, right? Like is like, you know, like is like really like, like is kind of like. Um, being is uh, another pretty gnarly interesting word and we often associate it with presence and um, feeling present and feeling fully present and even ambient. Uh, and there, um, my close friend and colleague, Rachel Strickland, many years ago, and I used to argue where I would say, Rachel, all things being equal, will you at least acknowledge that an HD video is more real than a standard video? She said, no, that IMAX is more real than a 35 millimeter. No. And she'd say, don't use the word real. And she convinced me that realness happens as much behind the eyes and ears as, as much as in front. And um, our late great uh, friend and colleague, uh, uh, Steve Gano, who died early, during this time proposed, well, maybe there should be a word for thereness. Thereness meaning you feel present, whether it's a cartoon or the real world. Some personal biases to get them out of the way quickly. Um, I'm interested in the real world and what you might call place representation. I have no qualms against fantasy and games and stuff like that. Um, but my beat is um, appreciation of uh, uh, the, the, the actual physical world. Um, I've spent most of the past five years uh, with students, mostly at NYU Shanghai and then last spring at UC Berkeley. Uh, and I'm more interested in exploration than polish. Uh, I want to see surprises. And given limited time and budgets, especially with students, 
Um, we, we put our eggs in the high risk experimental research basket more than polishing it up. Um, and we could go on and on about uh, gen AI. And uh, the one thing that I need to point out is that generative AI for pictures can do excellent jobs of credible images, but credible and authentic are two very different things. So you, you can make a credible 3D model of um, a uh, rural French village during World War II, but that's different than making an actual representation of an actual village. And if you don't believe me, you know, talk with people in Gaza, you know, or Ukraine right now. Uh, authenticity is important, and I worry a little bit about AI here. Okay, so this is what we're going to go through. Um, and I'm going at a very big clip. And what I'll do after each of these sections is pause and ask for questions. Fair enough? So we have, we have a, a runner that will run around and get six questions from and again, I apologize in advance for these times that I'll be switching to uh, YouTube and there might be problems. Ready? Let's begin. Okay, so making stuff early. Um, this has very little sound. Uh, I know two people and maybe three people in this room that saw this at SF MoMA in 1984. Five people, I think. Uh, so um, I, I hope you can see that what's going on here is that it's a reprojection of a living room back on itself with a slowly rotating film, 16 millimeter film projector, uh, placed on a rotating uh, turntable where the camera originally was. And the only other change is that everything is spray painted white and except the people. So ironically, uh, the stuff became very, very real looking. Um, note the guitar, but the people became very ghost like, and that's why it's called displacing, moving things away. Um, several years later, uh, I was cajoled into doing a newer version uh, at uh, Art Center at College of Design, Pasadena, in video. This is silent, by the way. And one of the funny things, just a little trivia, is that film cameras and film projectors are much more symmetrical than video and digital cameras and projectors. So it was actually harder uh, to line this up and, and get it right uh, compared to the film version. Note the guitar. So apologies, and uh, please let us know, you remote folks, if there's not going to be sound, and we'll try to fix it after this one. So I don't know her. Uh, she gave me credit. So note the guitar. So what's kind of cool about this is when you do scruffy stuff, people are gonna come and do a better job than you. And that to me is kind of cool. So we all know what projection mapping is uh, these days. And um, this is the Wikipedia history. Um, and um, Disney's listed as number one. Uh, George Harrison is listed as number two. Um, the Displacement SF MoMA project, uh, number three. Sondheim, uh, uh, Sunday in the Park with George after that. And then some very important work coming out of the University of North Carolina by Ramash Raskar, who's now at the MIT Media Lab. Okay, so here's something a little more recent. Um, we did this at NYU Shanghai um, several years ago. It's six students um, humming a 47 piece orchestral version of Beethoven's Ode to Joy. Do you want to try to do because it might be showing the thing that you want to see. No, the thing that they don't oh. want to see. Don't, don't, don't go far. Okay. Um, so uh, we had six students singing, humming a 47 piece orchestral version of both Beethoven's Ode to Joy uh, based on the layout of the Dublin Symphony Orchestra. Wow. 
home. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, and, um, and note that, so good. Are we okay? Thank you. So we shot everybody uh, separately and carefully um, measured, you know, the heights and the distance to make a uh, uh, fitting everybody together really easy it's like the early early days of special effects where, where you plan stuff in advance and uh try to get it right uh so this is a 3d uh stereoscopic 180 degree vr piece uh which can be viewed in vr headsets We, we called it a Sunday afternoon project. I mean, that was kind of the flavor, uh, the casualness of what we were going for. Um, so it turns out several months later in Shanghai, we showed it publicly at NYU Shanghai as a three screen 3D triptych with these new, you know, very high end. So. Okay. Okay. Oh, I can't. <laughs> Yes, okay. um, So several months after um, showing this, um, you know, Shanghai has these uh, video wall kiosks that appear, they're, they're everywhere around Shanghai. So this is actually in my apartment building. Um, that reads, it's nice to be a woman. Uh, there's an ad for cosmetic microsurgery. And, you know, our students would go out and work in agencies all the time. And there, there's no real way to prove there's any connection there. This is in my doctor's office. Uh, okay, so here's a really old, pardon? Did they solve that with people? They solve what with people? Were those all people? Or oh, oh yeah. No, no, the, no, those, those are live action people, <laughs> as you can do in an agency. Um, so uh, here's an older project that you all kind of know about regarding doing stuff early. This is a camera car from 1978 which recorded panoramic images at regular distance intervals. Um, it was an old MIT project called the Aspen Movie Map and the gray, uh, the brown blob of hair with a white coat on top uh, was me as a student um, uh, working on the project. So uh, the cameras uh, shot one frame every 10 feet and this is 30 years before Street View and uh, you can see that it's not streaming video and it's not still photos and it's not computer graphics. This distance triggered cinema look is kind of its own animal. Um, 
And unlike Street View today, our, our goal back then was like being there we, as best we could do. We would use the phrase all the time. Um, so um, I might get too much credit for the Ashland project, um, but I did end up doing like spending a bunch of years after doing other ones. This is Paris for the Paris Metro. Uh, yes, that's a mime. We hired a mime to add cinematic continuity by being in the frame. Uh, and it was for a how to find your way around uh, a kiosk that was installed on uh, the, uh, the metro station. Uh, several years later, this is a project for the Exploratorium. This is a large gyro stabilized helicopter camera. Um, uh, the cool thing is that whole thing can be replaced by something that fits in the palm of your hand today. That's kind of cool. So the idea was not to simulate a helicopter as much as to provide a hyper real, hyper real experience like this, something that you can't get in the real world. That, that it's more like being Superman, Superwoman. A uh, little after that, the Center for Arts and Media in Karlsruhe, Germany, uh, the ZKM, uh, commissioned me to do something similar. They said, we have the greatest tram system in all of Europe, and it goes down to the Black Forest. And I worked with them, and we instrumented a camera, same thing, to the tram's odometer. And uh, we had a chance to uh, uh, have it orthoscopically proper. That is, the scale is right. It really looked and feel like a big window uh, uh, when you're at least standing in the right place. Um, a you are here map. And because um, the, the rails, the, the image stability is unrivaled and that's kind of cool. I mean, it really does give it this, this unique and interesting look, but it was 2D. Oh, um, so in 2009, they reshot everything and did a wonderful then and now installation. They gave me too much credit. I had really nothing to do with it. Um, so here's a version for the Banff Center for the Arts. Um, we're still talking a long time ago. Uh, that's stereoscopic and it's distance triggered. Um, and for a bunch of reasons, we packaged it as a turn of the last century kinetoscope. We needed a crank, we needed an eye hood. And I wanted it to very much be about uh, the politics of tourism and indigenousness in Canada and the Banff uh, Center. So it was kind of a takeoff of tourism back then. Uh, nevertheless, when you put your eyes up to the hood and you turn the crank, you would get a, a properly scaled, properly left-right image, properly focused image. And as you turn the crank back and forth, you would be moving through. And even though it's not perfectly smooth, and you can go at hyper real rates, um, uh, and, and your head's tilted down, it kind of doesn't make sense, but you, you feel like you're there. Most people would, would kind of say that. Um, where is this now? The American Museum of the Moving Image. Um, so it also fueled research for how to make 3D models out of pictures. This is a long time ago. There, we, as best we could do, we would use the phrase all the time. Um, so um, I might get too much credit for the Ashland project, um, but I did end up doing like spending a bunch of years after doing other ones. This is Paris for the Paris Metro. Uh, yes, that's a mime. We hired a mime to add cinematic continuity by being in the frame. Uh, and it was for a how to find your way around uh, a kiosk that was installed on uh, the, uh, the metro station. Uh, several years later, this is a project for the Exploratorium. This is a large gyro stabilized helicopter camera. Um, uh, the cool thing is that whole thing can be replaced by something that fits in the palm of your hand today. That's kind of cool. So the idea was not to simulate a helicopter as much as to provide a hyper real, hyper real experience like this, something that you can't get in the real world. That, that it's more like being Superman, Superwoman. A uh, little after that, the Center for Arts and Media in Karlsruhe, Germany, uh, the ZKM, uh, commissioned me to do something similar. They said, 
we have the greatest tram system in all of Europe and it goes down to the Black Forest. And I worked with them and we instrumented a camera, same thing to the trams odometer. And uh, we had a chance to uh, uh, have it orthoscopically proper. That is the scale is right. And it really looked and feel like a big window uh, uh, when you're at least standing in the right place. Um, a you are here map. And because um, the, the rails, the, the image stability is unrivaled, and that's kind of cool. I mean, it really does give it this, this unique and interesting look, but it was 2D. Oh, um, so in 2009, they reshot everything and did a wonderful then and now installation. They gave me too much credit. I had really nothing to do with it. Um, so here's a version for the BAM Center for the Arts. Um, we're still talking a long time ago. Uh, that's stereoscopic and it's distance triggered. Um, and for a bunch of reasons, we packaged it as a turn of the last century kinetoscope. We needed a crank, we needed an eye hood. And I wanted it to very much be about uh, the politics of tourism and indigenousness in Canada and the Banff uh, Center. So it was kind of a takeoff of tourism back then. Uh, nevertheless, when you put your eyes up to the hood and you turn the crank, you would get a, a properly scaled, properly left-right image, properly focused image. And as you turn the crank back and forth, you would be moving through. And even though it's not perfectly smooth, and you can go at high real rates, um, uh, and, and your head's tilted down, it kind of doesn't make sense, but you, you feel like you're there. Most people would, would kind of say that. Um, where is this now? The American Museum of the Moving Image. Um, so it also fueled research for how to make 3D models out of pictures. This is a long time ago. And uh, the idea was to take the stereo pair and generate depth and then splat um, now the point cloud in space, even though there are a lot of occlusions. Uh, so that was one of the good deals that people like me made with people like my boss at Interval Research, that I could go um, out in the real world and shoot stuff, and my colleagues would have something more interesting in parking lot and hallway demos. Um, so uh, the uh, uh, H. Baker and J. Woodfill, Harlan Baker and John Woodfill, still very active computer vision people, uh, P. DeBevick and L. Villarreal went off to do more interesting things. Paul um, pretty much invented this thing of a uh, light stage uh, to the extent that he captured Obama in the White House. And Leo's the guy who did the bridge here, our bridge. Yeah. Um, so what does this tell us about making stuff early? It's not commercially motivated. It's relatively cheap and unpolished. Someone will do be better versions. Got to live with that. Um, and these are phrases that I like from that, um, under the radar from Red Burns, formerly at uh, NYU. Unsupervised, uh, art as unsupervised research, uh, art theorist Benjamin Bratton, and uh, the wonderful child psychologist, Alison Gopnik, who's made a distinction between exploration and exploitation, because she found that when you give four-year-olds a problem, they don't try to immediately solve it, but they very consistently try to break it more and discover and try to understand it. So it's exploration over exploitation. And, uh, you know, at its best, inspiring students and interns to do good stuff. Okay. Are there any questions? We'll do this five times. So, you know, uh, and we'll do it after. And we'll do it after too. Okay. Good. Okay. So um, mediated presence. So a lot. Oh, little out of little louder. Okay. Um, many years ago, I was invited to give a artist talk to a group of ten year olds um, in in the Boston public schools, and um, uh, I stood up in front of them, and there was a projection screen on a stand here. And I said, how do you know I'm not a movie? And they were all sitting on the floor, you know, and they were blank. And I asked them again, and they, they were blank. And I said, do you know I'm not a movie? And they all nodded their heads. I said, fine, how do you know I'm not a movie? 
So somebody raised their hand and said, well, your feet are below the screen. Okay, that's good. Uh, somebody also said, you're answering our question. That's good. And some kid in the back said, we know you're not an actor, okay, wh whatever. But the, the point is we know virtually all the time, at least visually and most of the other senses, when we're in a movie and when we're not in a movie. We, we just know that. I, oddly, um, audio, we've all, I think, had the experience of mistaking a live person in the room when you have a good audio system and you turn around. But th the rest of the stuff is hard. And one way to look at it is if we knew what all of the elements um, uh, to make up um, uh, uh, any form of sensory representation. And I think most experts would agree we do. And if we make the analogy to a sliding board, and if we could turn all the sliders up to 10, which I believe every expert that knows their salt says we can't, but in theory, then the representation would be indistinguishable from uh, the subject. And so as a starting point, uh, you know, we can begin with our sensors and, and it's, it's true in the other direction with our output. So the question uh, as a way of kind of organizing this, and again, I'm coming out of teaching for a few years, not when I do lifelong, what does it take to trick our sensors and effectors into believing that a representation is real? And um, my kind of way of thinking about this is to start with what does it take to fool one eye constrained, looking at one flat image on the screen. And I would ask students, um, if you went to Best Buy and bought a really good display, and if the display showed an apple and you could only view it from one eye and you can't see around it, how many of you think that it would be indistinguishable from an actual apple. And most students raise their hand. And then you say, well, what if it's a kitty or a person? And most of the hands come down. Um, but what's interesting about simply understanding this part of just like being there is that it's where most of the audiovisual uh, industry lives, uh, right? So, you know, things like pixel count and brightness and, and uh, uh, dynamic range and photorealism and whatnot is simply trying to fool one eye in an unconstrained way looking at a rectangle. It's a little bit harder to fool two eyes, uh, but there's a long and lively history of stereoscopy and stereophony to go on. So, uh, but then it gets a little bit harder when we allow for free head movement, and especially when we're coming from stuff that was camera based and where you might do some hybrid model situation, which we'll talk about. Uh, but now we're getting into things like position tracking and volumetric and light field video and spatial and binaural sound. Um, and then the next kind of level up is what does it take to fool um, your eyes and ears um, totally surrounded uh, in 3D and, and panoramic. And again, this is generally easier in 3D CGI um, th than it is when you're, you're coming from, from images. So at this point, one should be able to understand what does it take to fool your eyes and ears. It's even more challenging uh, to add non-audiovisual senses. Um, and uh, smell and taste are in a very different category than haptics. And haptics is an extraordinarily lively and interesting uh, and challenging one that has many, many, many aspects. If we could do all this, then you would be able to uh, see, hear, touch, taste, and smell. But um, you're basically a ghost. You're, you're in some kind of environment. So the next level up in this way of organizing things is to add interactivity. Um, so, uh, and we know sort of all the technologies involved with this. So n now you can see here, uh, deal with the other senses and have some kind of effect on what's going on, but it could be dead. It could be just you. So the final frontier and the biggest challenge and what's up with so many of the tech giants right now is uh, social uh, and live. Um, so that's my approach. Um, uh, 
I uh, hosted it on Medium several years ago, NYU Shanghai translated into Chinese uh, that's up and running and it's easy to find on Medium. But the funny part is uh, this is a uh, Apple uh, report I did in 1991 called Elements of Real Space Imaging. Um, and the organization was basically developed back then. And um, you'll, you'll see how similar it is. And um, what's kind of cool is that in, in working on this that many years ago, uh, there's a missing piece that we have today, and that's live and social. The idea of live and social uh, in the context of immersive light being there, 1991, laughable. You're, you're talking about text-based dungeons and dragons and you know, stuff like that. Okay, so that's mediated presence. Questions? Yes. That necessarily needs to have higher visual values because a lot of the connection through voice, I just had a bunch of phone calls without visuals, were no. very, very powerful. No, you're, you're, you're totally right. And again, the reason I'm trying to understand this and share what I know is that this is complicated stuff. Um, and there are, and, and it's not only complicated, it's counterintuitive. So a lot of things that you think are going to work don't and vice versa, you know, so, so, right? Yeah. Let's give a oh God. Okay. Um, I can give a couple of technical ones. Okay. Here's one. So when interval research opened up in 1992, <laughs> Chad was there. Uh, several of our colleagues, 1992, uh, bought about a dozen high-quality pairs of microphones and high-quality pairs of speakers and had it go down to a server. And back then we had offices, you know, rather than, you know, open air. Uh, so these dozen offices all had very, very high-quality audio only with whoever they selected. And it's hard to describe how visceral and real it feels to be sitting and hearing somebody breathing and typing. That's all. Uh, and if I had to put my eggs in that versus some stupid little HD monitor this big in terms of conveying uh, uh, presence, you know, slam dunk. Does that help? A little. Well, it's complicated. Anything else? Okay, liveness. Another funny word, um, uh, because uh, wh wh what is live? And this was a fun game to play with students about before telegraph, what, what could live possibly mean to people from a long, long time ago? And uh, could, could Abraham be in Canaan and imagine his family in Ur? Uh, in real time, what does that mean? Could, you know, Columbus in, in, in America uh, imagine what Queen Isabella was eating for breakfast? Um, uh, th th there weren't even time zones yet, you know. Um, uh, Napoleon in Egypt. So I'm going to show a couple kind of extremely uh, uh, different examples, but kind of to share and stuff that I worked on. So I quickly want to show a project that um, we worked on at Ars Electronica in Linz, Austria for 2009 when Linz was uh, the designated EU culture capital. And, um, and they brought me in to direct uh, uh, 80 plus one, a journey around the world. And one of the things that we did was a call for proposals for live bits, art exploring uh, real-time connectedness. And uh, we had a couple hundred thousand euros to uh, do this and a few months very quickly to get projects. Um, we got 295 entries from 42 countries and selected 15. Um, and uh, here are a couple. And, and we made it clear that like live video is the least interesting shit. I mean, you know, we can do more interesting live stuff. So here's one from a... Um, uh, Chinese collective called uh, 8GG, where they had a live video 
between our little pavilion on the Huff Plots and Linz and their studio in Beijing. And, um, uh, and we could see them live in the hole below. They had put a lot of effort into how to take Chinese food and uh, 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 capture the smell. And they made these kind of soap bar like things and a little heating element. So they would hold up in real time live an image or you know, a plate of Kung Pao chicken, and they could see us, and there'd often be kids, and say, wouldn't you love this Kung Pao chicken? Smell this. And out of the hole at the bottom, this aroma of Kung Pao chicken would come. Um, this is a project um, called uh, uh, Grand Mutual Smiles um, uh, between Timbu, Bhutan, and Linz. This is around the time that cameras had smile detection on it, you know, for portraits. So um, uh, uh, Austrian artist Pierre Prosk uh, 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 used that and did live smile kind of stuff between uh, uh, Timpu, Bhutan, and Linz. Here's a project called Digite from uh, Marion Schmidt in Germany. Again, very simple and addressing uh, uh, another good example. It's a box with a camera. And there's one here and one there. In this case, it was, uh, I think, Berlin and uh, Linz. And you stick your hand in the box, somebody there sticks their hand in the box, and you see both hands. You can't feel the hands, and there's no audio. But there's something oddly intimate about a real-time kind of hands thing. Here's a project by our colleagues at NYU called Link Cube. Um, that was basically green screen between the, uh, the two sites, New York and uh, Lens, and other projects included vibration platform triggered by real-time traffic at the entrance of the Gotard Tunnel, uh, live audio from a town square in Gaza, and microblogging from industrial workers in Petesky, Romania, and this project. Um, it's called Water in Africa, uh, Water in Austria by Melissa Fatomi Toure, uh, who uh, is from Mali and had an engineering degree, and her uncle uh, owned a uh, internet cafe in a village uh, uh, in Mali uh, that had only one um, pump. And the project was to put sensors on the pump to determine in real time how much water was coming out and send it to Linz to the restroom in our little pavilion. And if you're in there, if less than enough water to flush the toilet had not been pumped since the last person, there was the coin slot, you'd have to put money in. Here's anything odd about this image. Just shout out. Like maybe it's fake? No. It's totally fake. <laughs> you know, look at it. And it was, it was done by a Berlin-based prankster, uh, Nicholas Roy. Uh, the image is photoshopped. Um, and, um, uh, and we discovered midway through the run, summer of 2009, and brought him to give a, a talk and everything and, and kept it up. And uh, it turns out that it uh, raised almost 1,500 euros, which uh, we all then decided to give to an actual water project in Africa. Questions about liveness? So we do have a question in the chat from Maricela. There's a little bit of an echo. Um, Not actually a question. <laughs> it was an answer to the question. Oh, um, yeah, she's saying, what is liveness? Liveness to me sounds like something to ask anthropologists, linguists, historians and cog scientists, uh, interdisciplinary studies. Um, yeah, I mean, again, just remember that like not that long ago, what we mean by liveness didn't exist. And we could even argue about where does things break? Like is a one second or a one minute delay from something quote in real time still constitute live? Um, so I hope that kind of answers it. It's a funny word. Of course, we use it every day. For example. Back, back in the um, 80s, people like Bill Buxton were writing how um, video conference calls were worse than audio conference calls because, and, and the reason was the lack of liveness. They, they, when you start having more than 50 milliseconds 
well, two, social, the social amount of time for, for conversation is one to 300 milliseconds max, maximum. And when you have longer delays than that, then people would just rather not do it. Uh, and, or, you know, certainly they would rather do one that has lower latency. And, and the latency has gone away with video conferencing and now we're enjoying it, but that's an example of liveness changing. Yeah, I think. thank you, thank you. Um, okay, here's a more recent um, live uh, project that I directed at NYU Shanghai over the past few years. Um, so the pitch was to say, hey, let's take a standard desktop display and surround it with this new generation of depth cameras and lights and mics and speakers and put magic stuff over the front to give stereoscopic image. And let's build two of them and hook them up together and see how close we can come to unmediated, just like being there, uh, liveness for teleconferencing. This began in 2018, so this is, had nothing to do with COVID at the time. Um, and uh, so conventional approaches uh, generally uh, use one camera, or assume you only have one camera, and we were hell-bent on surrounding cameras. Um, and gaze correction is one big uh, area of work there. Um, another is making 3D out of a single photo. This is from a few years ago, and these are four photos of me run through that program. Um, I, I don't think any of them look like me, but the point is they don't look like each other, right? Um, they're, they're trying to use machine learning on something that's a very complicated uh, thing, like a human face and head. Uh, this is from just a few months ago. NVIDIA is showing the same kind of thing, and they're proud of doing it with one non-depth camera. And, and the rest is, you could call it hallucinated. Uh, and um, uh, depending on what it is that you really wanna do. So in summer uh, 2018, we had it up and running with four, actually five cameras. And uh, this is an actual image. Um, so as you moved around, it would track your eyes and uh, uh, aim left eye, right eye, uh, to your eyes as you move around. It's eye tracked out of the stereo. It's not that particularly new. Um, by uh, summer of 2019, we had four cameras uh, working together and that um, um, kind of filled in missing parts, which was our, our whole kind of intent here, filling in the uh, occlusions. And then summer 2020 came along in Shanghai and COVID was everywhere. And um, we after spending two or three years of unsupervised research said, you know, we know quite a bit about this. Maybe we can do something practical. And, um, and we were working, you know, with summer students and, you know, throughout the year, and we thought we could focus on college students around the world because we can assume that they all have a laptop and smartphone. What can we do? And we went down all of the usual routes about um, uh, sound and, and scene correction and stuff. And we came across something that we first rejected. Uh, uh, we thought it was kind of a dumb idea until we tried it. And taking the uh, speaker view off the real estate of your screen, which might have lesson plans on it, and putting it above and using the same camera from your laptop really worked like a charm. And we went into the 3D printed bracket business and got a little bit of internal funds to make a bunch of them and pass them out for free and publish it. Uh, we got over 35,000 views. Uh, this is from Nebraska. And um, meanwhile, uh, we had published our work and unbeknownst to us during this period, Google had been working on something similar um, called Project Starline. Um, uh, I've heard through the grapevine that they've spent $2 billion on this, unverified. Um, and uh, this is their camera system uh, because they're Google. And this is their camera system compared to our camera system. And the weird and funny part is a few months ago, um, they scaled down. They decided what is needed and what's not needed. It's not a bad research approach if you can afford it. And so now their system actually looks a lot like ours. And I'm like, so what, what do we do? I don't know. We, we actually applied for a patent uh, in, in Shanghai and uh, learned last week that it's going through. So I don't know, I'm open to stuff like, like this. That's a whole kind of related uh, discussion with several of you and I've had before. Um, and so, and any questions about liveness? Yes. 
No, I haven't. Has anybody seen Starline? Pardon? Oh, has he asked if I saw project, uh, the Project Starline in person? Uh, and the answer is no. Has anybody in this room seen Project Starline? <laughs> uh, can you say anything? Is it good? Good. <laughs> uh, Chris Bregler, director uh, at uh, Google. Um, so um, they they apparently have enough of an enterprise uh, stuff going on that there are people kind of lining up to to try prototypes. It's kind of interesting. Any other questions? Yes. So hundred years ago, Disney and other conventions left the home. You know, you left the human friends. So right. You fall in love with a sack of potato coming alive. Have you thought along those lines? Because you started, like, if I only hear audio, I hallucinate a person. Is there an artful way not to overwhelm the system with slightly wrong pixels and just have a cartoon version of yourself or something like that? And that's lifeness, you know? And that's a billion dollar question. Okay, so later. Yeah. Um, and, and I'll add that to the billion dollar questions I have coming up in a moment. So hold, hold that thought. Elizabeth, do you have anything? It's not the same question, really, which is I think that human liveness and connection can be a, <clears throat> and then I guess, and then Absolutely. we're done. Right. A moment. Yep. Yep. I, I totally agree. So, so the, the idea that so much of liveness is uh, dealing with human subtlety. Can we do that? Um, but but it, it real time, and let's say for the moment that means like way under second, like you and I looking at each other, is critical, right? With, without that, you, you've lost it. So embodies, embodies good. Embodies is good. Yeah. Absolutely. I guess. And yeah, trust and eye gaze uh, is what Elizabeth is bringing up, and and of course filmmakers know this all the time about you know where you look and and how difficult and beautiful these yeah, captures. Just a comment about this. I think that I think that um, fantasy is obviously gives that sense of presence in many many situations. Books have always been doing that, sure. and and even even movies do that. And I I I know you work on that whole concept of making people feel the experience. Is quite different than making something that is the that is is realistic. Right. I think that's that's your main. Well, and, main and the other thing is, I mean, if there's a subtext of this whole talk, is we want surprises. We we have a whole bunch of uncharted territory, and rather than competing closely with everybody else at these trade shows on the same six ideas, uh, there's a lot to explore. And 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 I will probably say how often I'm wrong about my hunches. And then I learned stuff. Okay. Uh, remote travel. So now I'm going to go. Yeah. Tell us about what you Oh, um, well, certainly the, the, the scaling the tele window down from here to here, everything went out the window. The four cameras and to be able to do this, if the image is this big, you know, like 20, 30 degrees is all you need. And, and the NVIDIA people will win on dimensionalizing a single 2D picture um, if you limit, if you constrain the viewpoint. Uh, by the way, as an aside, um, so, and this deals with Professor Dr. Bregler as well, that if you think you're talking with a real-time fake on video, ask them to turn to the side. Ask them to show their profile. We'll leave it at that. Okay. Okay. So remote travel, I'm going to begin with a whirlwind tour through a couple hundred years of the just like being there thing, because a good place to start is where the word panorama was coined in the late 1700s uh, uh, for painting enormous paintings uh, that could be wrapped around and viewed properly cylindrically and uh, giant buildings. This is all through the 1800s. And, and you would walk in, you'd walk up a balcony, and you'd appear in the middle of this thing. And why? Just to be there. They, 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 they were all about just kind of hanging out at a place. And um, they, they were built all over the world, the most popular art form throughout the 19th century. And they really were about, like, 
you know, bring the kids, pull up a chair. Um, and um, uh, to make them look more like being there, they would build um, uh, real uh, uh, props between the viewing platform and the screen. One of the most popular was uh, the Battle of Gettys uh, Gettysburg in um, 1891. And, uh, you know, the funny thing is that when you're doing painting, the resolution of these things are crazy. They're just really, really high. Nothing moves. Um, but also note the narrow vertical field of view here. And we'll get to that in a moment. Um, this was another super popular uh, thing in the late 1800s. One thing interesting about uh, stereoscopes is that all the companies agreed right at the beginning to use the same format the figure. So everybody was making these cards and making these viewers and they were super popular and they did say around the world just like being there. That's really what it was about. Um, less than uh, five years after the birth of cinema in 1895, um, the Paris 1900 exposition was coming up and uh, several people made this big 10 camp panoramic rig for a surround environment that had a fake balloon on top, the viewing platform, uh, 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 and you're looking at screens from the 10 projectors and uh, it never opened because the film back then was nitrate film and very, very flammable and new. And they said, no, no, you can't do it. So it never actually opened. Um, it took uh, until 1927 for French filmmaker Abel Gantz to spend several years on his epic Napoleon, um, uh, which he developed this three screen version to have these panoramic, you know, beautiful uh, three screen triptychs. Uh, it premiered at the Paris o Opera House. It had a 15 minute standing ovation, um, but 1927 is when the talkies appeared. This was a silent film. Some of you may have seen it either at, um, uh, the Opera House uh, in San Francisco in the early 80s or uh, uh, the Paramount Theater in Oakland a few years ago with a live orchestra. Amazing film. One of the side notes that Abel Gantz, as he was working on this, became equally obsessed with colliding discontiguous images as well as making one big one. Uh, he was as much interested in the non-real hyper-real as uh, the real one. Uh, by uh, the early 1950s, Cinerama caught on three screens almost 180 degrees, five operators, you can count them back then, crazy three screen, uh, three, three camera uh, system. This is the way you had to slate it back then. By um, uh, the mid 1950s, the Disney people were making circle vision, um, which was just continued in world's fairs all over the world. And also notice the narrow vertical field of view, and it's partly because they used cameras pointing up uh, at, a, at a mirror at a 45 degree angle so that the cameras would all share the same spot to eliminate um, artifacts, but it was limited. We all know about Viewmasters. Uh, by the early 90s, um, Tom DeFonte and Dan Sandine invented the cave, uh, which was the first digital um, multi-projector surround thing. Now, one thing interesting, it's coming out of a real-time computer, but um, only one person is wearing a head tracker. So everybody can be wearing 3D glasses, but only one person doing this gets the sweet uh, view from this. Um, I'm going to squeeze in this project uh, um, uh, working at Interval, Paul Allen's Interval at the time. Um, and uh, the UNESCO World Heritage Center, and it was originally done for the Arabuena Center for the Arts, though it's played around. So um, the idea was to shoot very high resolution, temporally as well as spatially, uh, stereoscopic with rotating, slowly rotating cameras, play it back in a room with a slowly rotating giant projector. But we couldn't do a giant rotating projector back then, so we rotated the people. And the sound, this is with the curtain down. And it sounds kind of dumb, but you've all had the experience of being on a train in the station with the train next to you pulls out and you can swear you're moving. Um, so with the curtain around it, if you're standing there, you're wearing 3D glasses, you're looking at a 60 degree, a big wide-ish field of view. Um, 
And you, f you really feel like it's rotating around you very, very quickly. And it was that visceral feel, which is what it was all about. Uh, colleague uh, Luc uh, Crochet in Montreal uh, started by building upside down domes, low resolution because one fisheye lens, um, and ended up um, uh, uh, building a 60 foot diameter uh, a dome in Montreal that's uh, 3D capable. And the full dome community that takes over planetaria after hours now that they're digital, 1200 strong around the world, interesting community. Um, my friend and colleague, Jeffrey Shaw, uh, uh, has done projects um, like me um, dealing, in fact, he's the only other person I know that does stereoscopic uh, installations in cylindrical rooms with uh, of UNESCO World Heritage Sites with rotating platforms. Um, I did them first. Uh, his work is really good, by the way. Um, and then go, going back to like, a couple months ago, September, uh, has anybody been to the MSG sphere yet? <laughs> Why am I not surprised? Is it as amazing inside as they say? Yeah, yeah okay. So it's IMAX on steroids. It holds 10,000 to 20,000 people. It's the largest number of pixels on the inside ever built. Um, it's noteworthy that even so big, um, you can look way up and you can look almost around and you can not entirely look background. Why? Because you're sitting in the seat. Okay, so uh, here's another project. This was uh, from the New York Times of, I think, 2019, one minute video. Um, so, <laughs> so you get the idea. It, it was somebody with a steady cam or some, you know, stable camera uh, going this carefully scripted thing uh, through the Met and then stopping and, and they took the, the routes footage and sped it up. And then they took the, you call it destination footage and kept it live action. And my students at NYU Shanghai thought it was really cool, but it would be a lot cooler if it was in VR, Stereo 360 and interactive, where every time you got to one of these spots, you chose where to go to next. So that's what we did. Um, uh, we we uh, used the campus building as, um, uh, as our stage, and we made it interactive by adding, by whatever means necessary, including paper on the ground, uh, options that you could then choose. So th this is a 360 image. You know, in VR, you would see this um, uh, correct. Two choices, pick one, go. A lot of this work was struggling between game engines and video. Just um, So here's another piece of the remote travel thing that I, I think is important. Um, this is a project uh, at USC uh, 2008 or something uh, between uh, USC Cinema um, and uh, Institute for Creative uh, Technologies. And uh, the idea was to take your images and, and position them in a 3D Earth model like Google Earth in such a way that they appear seamless. Uh, and it was important to us that they were your images. Uh, there was a lot of work going on, Microsoft in particular, uh, where the more neutral the image is, the easier it is to process. And we said, no, we, we want to invert that, even if it takes a little bit of human intervention. Um, so this is a little demo, just a minute. So you see, when you get it right, it, it's kind of magic, you know? And if it's not right, um, uh, it, at least significantly, it, it kind of doesn't serve the purpose. Noteworthy 
when our team was working on this and spending long days bouncing around Google Earth from place to place, we realized that we'd all go to bed at night and have that physical motion memory that you'd have after a day of skiing or biking or body surfing or something. It's very visceral. And, um, and that was on a laptop. The Google Earth is, is available in VR and it's even more visceral. And that's kind of what we were shooting for. Um, I'm not going to show somewhere street. I'd love to, but I want to go to a, a quicker clip. Uh, it's been on for years in HK. Um, uh, it's a little like Borat in that it's semi-scripted with someone wandering. Oh, let me show you something quick. I'm going to break it. I'm not going to try. Uh, uh, wandering through streets and uh, with, with a steady cam and approaching people. And, oh, look, um, it's a store. They're making some, are those dumplings? And then they would talk, you know, back and forth. And it's really kind of charming. I, I don't know why it's so charming. And they do these out of the way places. And what's clever is they translate it into like a half dozen languages and they, they can do that and it still works. Um, so it's, uh, uh, and a shot of human height, which I think is important. The only thing I wanna point out about video walks, uh, and again, I'm gonna try to stay on my computer, um, is that, um, has anybody looked at video walks? Someone with a camera and they walk in real time? There's this whole community of people doing it. And all I know is that there's like a two hour video walk. It's pre-recorded, it's not live. Just walking through 6.7 million viewers. I mean, there's something interesting going on about remote travel and just video walking. So an old buddy of mine, um, uh, William Bill Durham, who's now semi-retired at Stanford, I had the opportunity to show uh, his first VR experience. And he's uh, uh, not into high tech, even though he's Stanford, and pointed out that actual travel and tourism represents 10% of the global workforce and got all excited and said, VR virtual travel can be a win, 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 win proposition good for people unwilling or unable to go. Uh, and I used to tell my students, if you ever hear me use the word holodeck, shoot me. And if you ever hear me, I, I have to change on that, by the way, it's like holograms. Um, but um, the just like being there puts the bar um, way too high. And even leveling off to the next best thing to being there could make some really interesting immersive virtual travel, uh, uh, I think, look pretty good. Uh, it's good for people willing and unable to go, uh, willing and able to go. Uh, good for the place and good good for the planet. And uh, don't laugh. But um, the idea of being co-present with people um, in, in a headset where, where you're touching them, you know, and you, you can hear them. They don't have to be together, um, but but the, the only other option to do this in, in your home pretty much is to build like a flight simulator or something. So as much as I love to do projection, uh, for the home headsets are, are the only way to get this you know, like really, really rich 3D head track stuff. Yes. I'm just gonna add a moment that I had where I was in Taiwan at the Royal Museum talking to the curator of the Royal Museum. And I probably almost got put in jail for this, but I, I pointed out that they'd stolen all these artifacts from all over China. And wouldn't it be amazing if they put kiosks in all the places they'd stolen them from where those people could visit and have, have you know, control the cameras and run around the things in this museum, for example. Just kind of that's- Well, uh, yeah, and, again, this can go in so many different directions. I, I'm a big fan of- uh, physical repatriation of stuff where the original, you know, the, the British Museum or whatever host um, makes digital copies for the British Museum, funds a local on-site museum for the actual artifacts and has a live connection to it. So, so the artifacts go home, exactly. and, you know, yes, yes. okay, again, so, um, Okay, so any other uh, questions about remote travel? It, it, it's a big issue and 
again, I'm surprised that there hasn't been more done, but you all want to know about the billion dollar question. So um, this is just kind of my first stab at it. Got yeah, a question. Several years ago, the, the most popular television program, um, I think it was in Norway, was real-time recording for the television channel there of going through some of the, the straits and the glaciers for days at a time. Became yeah. the most popular television. Yeah. It was amazing. And, and there, there are bird cameras and stuff. Thank you. Um, you know, I fully expect to wake up one morning and see some surprise coming out of nowhere going, whoa, that's a really cool idea. Where did that come from? Um, so uh, the, the first of these billion dollar questions um, uh, is kind of a funny one, especially for those of you here working at these places. Um, and uh, so, you know, the current scorecard is uh, Microsoft decided to be untethered and Apple coming out in February now. Uh, to be tethered. And of course, the advantage of um, tethering is um, you can pack more processing and power. You can have a better experience with a little bit of compromises. Um, I don't know details. I've read that people have been fired in both companies over fights about which way to go. This is kind of a temporary problem, so it's not that interesting compared to some of the other ones. Um, uh, so I, I want to take them separately because um, if you're sitting, if, if the by the way, so the Apple Vision Pro eight minute video demo that you all can see, if you count the number of people, the number of times people are sitting versus standing, they're almost always sitting, not not entirely. If you're sitting, you don't need 360. You need close to 360, but that's relevant for something like this. The reason my student is um, using broomsticks basically to push the camera is because she appears relatively small in the 360 degree field of view and uh, we can we can um, uh, cut her out. We can just blacken that area. If you're sitting, you're not gonna care. And what are the options? I mean, this is Google's option and all of a sudden you get this very different perspective uh, uh, in, in, in the name of capturing 360, but guess what? It looks different. Uh, this is uh, Jeffrey's installation again, Jeffrey Shaw, and this happened with me for being out here. Unless you're going to build a public space um, cyclorama with a balcony going up, you know, from the center, you're going to need a hole to get in and out. Um, and and so this idea of relaxing the 360 uh, view might be okay. By the way, you can't see it well here. But there are something like eight little video projectors along the top. And when you're standing in this room, and it typically has a full image, you go, why are those lights rotating around you? And it turns out um, that they chose to slowly rotate the image, so slow that you barely notice it, so you don't have a permanent hole there. And, and you, th you think that the lights are rotating, uh, but, you're, uh, but the image is. Well, camera obscures are interesting on a bunch of, you're talking about like the one down yeah, here. Yeah, you've got a room and then you kind of get a hole in it and you look out for it. Yeah, camera obscures and, and they're live. Right. So, so that, that's real. kind of, right, and they're, they're real. That's kind of an interesting part. So uh, standing, um, uh, so um, I'll confess, uh, Supernatural VR, which is a uh, um, workout program that for VR that when I first heard about, and I know these guys, I thought, what a dumb idea. It like pushed all the wrong buttons uh, in me until I tried it and I use it almost every day. I love it. I was wrong about everything and I won't go into a lot of that. Um, but one thing interesting is that uh, we talk about in VR um, six DOF, six degrees of freedom, where uh, the first three are like a tripod, pan, tilt, and roll, and the second three are left, right, up, down, and in, in, out. And there's a lot of talk, especially if you're coming out of the gamer industry, that you need six DOF so you can move around a room to play games in VR. Th there's 
a smaller category of six off where you're just standing still. And the um, supernatural people have done a really good job. You're standing in more or less one area. And when you do this, you, you see movement, you see parallax going back maybe a hundred feet from photographic images, 360 photographic images. It's surprising how good it works. And um, uh, uh, so, so, you know, it's kind of a new category. And these are some experimental cameras uh, coming out of uh, Facebook, Meta, and Google, because uh, it might be that something about this big that you can essentially interpolate well, anything within the sphere would be enough to do it. By the way, the camera on the right, uh, designed by Paul de Bevec, now in the world of generative AI, has probably three or four times more cameras than, than, than is needed. That, that whole thing has changed overnight. Um, and then uh, walking is a much difficult uh, problem, and it's noteworthy that Apple's pitch is indoors only, and Meta is so hell-bent on assuming that everybody's going to want to wear glasses um, from when they get up in the morning when they go to bed at night. And um, my students generally have disagreed. I ask them every semester uh, whether you would want to wear these all the time. And again, Apple's been taking a more uh, enterprise approach and that you're going to want to have an extreme experience before um, a relatively uh, short time. Um, another one, uh, well, this relates, I already said this. Will people be wearing things even if they have the form factor of glasses um, all the time? And the jury is so, so out on that. Um, and then, uh, you know, interactive and non-interactive depends a lot whether you're coming from games or cinema. And when you look at everything available in headsets, you really have this clear distinction between the movie people doing linear uh, and, and the game people doing highly interactive. The word cartoonish is often associated over here and will for a little more time. And, um, and the cinema people will point out that you can capture as much uh, street view as you want, but what makes cinema important is that we need sound and we need live action. Um, so, you know, it's it's kind of the questions out. And one of the elements related to this, and I get into arguments with my colleagues, is whether camera movement is okay in VR, because the traditional view is that if something happens over there, you should in theory be standing up, sitting on the floor in a rotating chair, do this, rather than what cinematographers have known forever, uh, to direct attention. And, okay, so we're going to see if this is going to work. In a minute. Uh, I, that's the... Uh, uh, here we go. Yeah, so I'm going to um, stand by. It's finding my mouse, by the way, that's the hardest part of this. Uh, okay. And we're going to keep it this big for now rather than messing the stuff. <laughs> So you'll you'll get the idea. Um, oh crap! Now what did I do? First pandemic we are living through right now is something none of us could have ever imagined. Last few months, isolated physically, the internet allows me. And hold up. However, there's going to be more issues. So this is all viewable in VR, but there's a lot of camera movement. You can be sitting in a chair. Introduction of 
Okay, I'm going to move on. So uh, this was this was a semester that everybody was back home all over the world doing this. Um, that's good. Okay. Um, so regarding um, uh, virtual travel, um, one interesting way to look at this is uh, paths and destinations, like the New York Times thing and the project that our students did. Um, and um, again, it's kind of not considered okay in classic VR gaming to have constrained interactivity. But the reality is in most real world places, especially sacred and uh, fragile ones, you're constrained to pathways anyway. So the idea of designing projects where uh, experience where you have some amount of navigation and then you get to a spot and then you choose is kind of an interesting one. Um, I wrote something about this several years ago. How many people recognize this image? Uh, it's for another time. This is the world's first interactive movie. It was a total hack at uh, Expo 67. Brilliant. Um, uh, but it, it shows that we can play a lot with elements of interactivity. It's important to point out, though, the difference between interactivity, meaning you can freely move around, and interactivity, meaning uh, you can change the database, like blow things up. And uh, the first one is navigational, and the second one is manipulative, and they're two very different kinds of interactivity. So any questions about these billion dollar, we're almost done in the last section. Uh, because we're gonna move into something very different, I'm gonna go very quickly through something, but part of my job here is to mess with your minds a little bit. So um, this is a project that, um, this is from last year, uh, uh, a project called the Global Jukebox. Um, and a very weighty uh, paper that came out um, uh, with it. And the system currently includes about 6,000 traditional songs. They're all organized with the metadata, I'll explain in a moment, um, that, that allows you to find commonality uh, with song. Um, how long ago did this begin? The story begins in the 1860s. Um, in Central Texas, when John Lomax uh, was born, he was two or three years old, and um, he grew up here, and it's cowboy country, like real cows, real cowboys, and um, he uh, grew up listening to these songs, and uh, he ended up, this is John Lomax, becoming a folklorist, a very early ethnomusicologist, and uh, by the 30s, uh, tagging uh, his teenage son, Alan Lomax, around, they uh, did the verifiably first field audio recordings in that they took an audio recorder given to them by Thomas Edison's widow, and they made it portable to the tune of 500 pounds of stuff. Um, and and they, they drove around, and by the 1930s, uh, they had covered a lot of the... Uh, trying to do something here, the, the U.S., um, but over the next several, uh, okay, I'm going to... Database here. These are excerpts uh, of films from ethnographic filmmakers and travel, travelers and from all kinds of archives in Germany and Bulgaria. And, um, so regarding, um, and this is what we... I've coded. Have you budgeted for digitizing all of this stuff? No, I haven't. I didn't know I would have to do that. He was saying that the tapes are deteriorating. To my goal of my mini library of Congress, we have every, almost all the important types of American folk music covered here. Spirituals and or songs and ballads and dances and all the dance types. New Orleans and it's a good, it's a good picture of the country. This is uh, 
stay in Italy, Great Britain, and the West Indies, those are my special beats. Do you know how many hours are here? Well, there are about 5,000 tapes. One that fit on a video this. And here's the Golden Jukebox. This is this piece of art was made by Carol Kuhn. This is just a geography. You can roam around the world in here. Eventually, we'll have about a couple of thousand songs and dances here. Let's begin it. So it show that we're very cultivating. <laughs> We're going to move it with something very different. We want to make very important with this. Part of my job is to make it very different. So, um, Hello, this go. is a project. Into the backwoods of Italy a little bit. And you had a kind of singing that really gave rise to the opera voice. He's a long shot. And then way back in the Swiss mountains, we hear How long the real roots of the whole thing, European cliff from the dawn of time. Story begins Shepherds the taking their flocks up to the mountains. And uh, by the 30s, uh, having uh, his teenage son, Colin Lomax, in the room. The program that Mike has devised for comparing things cross-culturally. It, it wouldn't be possible without these new techniques, because we wouldn't know. Uh, we wouldn't be able to see, find, the, you know, find the woods for the trees. But now it's, it's as clear as a bell to me in the whole story. So I can now give that back. Decades, people were sending him song and dance from around the world. Uh, the recordings uh, helped be become the basis of the U.S. Library of Congress Folk Songs Archive. Uh, this is Alan Lomax in front, 1941. Uh, the guy in back is Jerome Weiser, Jerry Weiser, mm -hmm. uh, who uh, was a lifetime friend of um, Alan, who later became JFK's science advisor, uh, the president of MIT, and the co-founder with Nicholas Negroponte of the Media Lab. Um, so um, by the early 60s, Lomax and his team had amassed the world's largest collection, Later Dance. Um, they worked with a team at Columbia. They, they, they heard commonalities and patterns. And uh, this is so not generative AI. They, they came up from the bottom up. Sometimes the word folksonomy is used for this organic approach. Uh, they came up with 37 parameters to represent world music. It was important to them that they represent all world music. So one of the parameters is glottal stops and another one is rasp and stuff like that. And they started coding thousands of songs and um, uh, finding uh, commonalities like the music of Central Africa and the music of Georgia and Russia are statistically similar. Inuit is statistically similar to Patagonia. Um, not surprisingly, West Africa to the U.S. blues. Um, and uh, Alan became convinced that our expressive styles like song and dance are as resilient as our genes. Uh, uh, you can take a culture, thousands of people, force them to go across the ocean, wear different clothes, you know, uh, uh, eat different foods, uh, but their music survived and that's why we have the blues. Um, so he codified all this stuff and around that time, another guy, uh, George P. Murdoch, was codifying all of mostly pre-industrial everyday life 
Um, and this is actually so amusing. I don't want to stick on this, but um, th this is um, activities range from manliness to womanliness. So hunting large aquatic fauna and smelting ores are the top left and cooking and preparation of vegetal foods are at the top right. Um, so Lomax used this data set along with his music data set to cross-correlate and found even more kind of amazing things. In 1988, Alan sent, uh, Alan Lomax sent a cold letter to Apple, the Dear Apple Computer, and I was one of the young people involved early on in the Apple Multimedia Lab, and my boss, Christina Hooper-Wolsey, came up to me one day and said, have you heard of Alan Lomax? I said, no. She said, uh, he sent this, and she said, do you want it? I said, I do. So I flew out, the first contact with Alan, and the first thing he said to me is, I think I've discovered a unifying theory of culture. And by the end of the afternoon, he convinced me, and that was over 30 years ago, and I'm still convinced. Um, uh, so this, I hope we get sound on. Uh, it's a four minute video, it's the last video I think I've seen. Sorry, sounds coming from the back. That's Alan, that's me. Uh, Brenda Laurel, shot by Rachel Strickland. We'll get to that.
and he really did believe that he saw the whole story. And um, I went back to Apple and helped him get some money, which was an easy uh, one because the research director at the uh, time, Dave Nagel, the first thing when I mentioned Alan Lomax, said, Alan Lomax, I, I took banjo lessons when I was 14. So it was an easy sell. But almost nobody knew about his work with uh, the global jukebox and the metadata. Um, by the late 90s, uh, uh, Lomax let us produce his only uh, demo, uh, courtesy of NYU and Red Burns. Um, and it's very 1998. You can find it on, uh, on, on YouTube. Ellen died in 2002. His daughter, Anna Lomax Wood, the third generation, uh, took over the, the program. And uh, in 2011, a book came out on Lomax called The Man Who Recorded the World, uh, who inspired a generation of musicians. And that's really true. Uh, he popularized the blues, especially through the BBC in the 1950s, where songs inspired Lennon, McCartney, Townsend, Clapton. Um, the Rolling Stones named their band after a song, blues song they heard on his uh, uh, program. And um, uh, by 2012, the phrase global jukebox started getting some exposure. They tried several uh, you know, attempts uh, uh, to raise $50,000. They couldn't at the time with their celebrity friends. And, 2015, they raised some, but it's still kind of not a lot of money. Uh, in 2017, a very provocative story came out in the New York Times, the unfinished work of Alan Lomax's Global Jukebox Project. Um, and um, in uh, John Zwed's uh, otherwise excellent book, there's exactly one page on the Global Jukebox. Um, and um, he uh, gives... Lomax credit for this concept we called metadata, uh, this concept we call folksonomy, and um, gave me the last quote in the book that's not Lomax. The global jukebox has fallen into an abyss between academic and pop culture, between world saving and money making, and between content and technology. And in the new media industry, the technology folks seem to drive the content, not the other way around, which is kind of too bad. Um, so to me, and this is my last slide, essentially, um, the significance of the Lomax's Global Jukebox Project is, is bigger than music and the Lomax's and the Global Jukebox. It's about taking geotaggable assets, media, um, uh, and having them not on dots on a map, but embedded in a 3D Earth model, like the earlier project, Viewfinder, that allows users, um, you know the way movies have the plane, Indiana Jones, flying from one place to the other, viscerally bouncing around Earth uh, using a Google Earth or Apple maps from one to the other, uh, uh, that there's something there. And it's a combination of the dots on a map, the ground level bouncing around, rich metadata. Can the global jukebox story help us inform and create a giant common one earth model, maybe even increase our sense of connectedness? Um, I think the answer is yes. And this is something I posted on it last year. Um, so if you're interested, you can go find that. And with that, thank you. Michael, I, I remember um, in 1983 going to, um, to National Geographic with you, and it was obvious to me back then right. that you were interested in all of these, all of these issues, including loving that geolocated uh, knowledge base. And I, you. I, you asked about the IPAGO tribe in that, mm -hmm. in that, in that setting. But um, here we have some really great people in the, in the audience. We have great people online. Please, I know it's getting late, so we won't be able to spend all night here, but but I'm bet, I bet there's some comments. I mean, I, I jump up whenever I feel like it. Sorry about that. But these other people, Nikki has a has a microphone that she can pass to other people. And, um, and, and, and what are some comments from the audience and online? Um, so let's, uh, let's see what we have here. And then, and then afterwards, we have some more crudites 
and we can sit around a little bit, but you know. And take some home. Yeah. Fr fresh from the farm yesterday. Yes. Anyway. Uh, but, um, you know, you might want to reflect upon how you like to travel, like when you go to tourist destinations. Some people like to go alone and they like to walk alone. Some people like to share. Some people like to interact with locals more than others. But um, I think the party line is a very, very valid one and sort of the basis of Facebook. And I can't and disagree with the social element. And there is an in, there's a whole industry of motion platforms that go in all directions and motion, you know, uh, feed, force feedback gloves that do some of this stuff. And, 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 and the answer was yes, it matters, right? <laughs> it was, um, oh, well, okay, there was, uh, he comes first. Chris. Um, and then, okay, so, so in the, in AI, we have the Turing test and right. people want to pause it. Right. In VR, they're like all these other tests, like the ledge test. Yeah, right. you're afraid. You don't want to jump over the ledge. You right. you don't want to go there. There was like Chris Milk and others with 360 had clouds over Sidra, where they went into refugee camps, and right. there was this thing called empathy test. Right. You know, you have empathy for the people there, and you smile back. Do you have some favorite tests that the field should pass in your field? Some. Favorite. It's sort of a milestone, a test, like, um, I, if we actually, do all this, that, can we do X, it's, you know? It's a very good question. Yeah. And again, what I'm looking for is surprises. I, I want for somebody, for, for me to go, wow, I, I really feel like I'm there. Um, uh, Clouds Over Sidra, one of the first big video VR pieces, uh, when you look down in VR, um, you see that they put an awful lot of energy into fixing what's called the nodal hole. You know, it's where the tripod is. You kind of Photoshop it in, so when people do that. So so they were paying attention to um, uh, kind of little things like like that. But, you know, it's like sometimes stereo stereoscopy doesn't really matter. You know, MSG Sphere uh, is 2D. Um, so I think it all depends. But, and again, I, I encourage producers and students and designers um, to make stuff to try to challenge a lot of you know questions and produce some more new information. So just just what I would I would add to that is um, I think of you as an artist, and you know a scientist makes these algorithmic question things. He goes to I want to know if it feels great, you know, and I think that that's what I hear from you all the time. Is, you know, it's it's the experience, it's the emotional reaction that will tell us. Uh, well, well, re remember that so much of work going back to Google Glass and continuing with uh, uh, Facebook Meta is not about like being there. It's about giving you data. That's great. I'm glad to have you know text instructions here rather than here, but but that to me is on, on sort of. Uh, uh, an art and impact level, not that interesting. <laughs> the best pat the I was going to say thank you so much. And also, uh, artist, I think, is a, a great description of what you do. Artist, as an artist, um, you do provocations. So I want to go back to the first thing that you showed. Um, and say, I wasn't there, but I felt like I was there. Do you remember a video down El Camino where you just looked at the shop that was selling the clocks? The video of El there was Camino. a There was a video I think you made oh early my God, on you know that. down yeah. El Camino. And it was, exactly. it's always there. Yeah. It's always there. And that was something very important to me. Wow. Because it was about how time comes and time comes again. And it was incredibly inspirational as you, artist, gave me a feeling that has lived on forever. Do you remember that piece? You mean the piece going down El Camino? Oh, I do. The shop that never closes. Do you remember that one? 
I want to make sure we're talking about the same thing, and then I'll then I'll repeat it. Um, it's one mile of going down El Camino. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I didn't do that. That was done by the California Department of Transportation. Who, who but it was did, always associated with you. Yeah. Well, I, I, we we used it a lot at the Apple Lab. I, okay. That was that was before the Aspen Moving Lab. Okay. Uh, um, and. Um, D uh, d do other people know about this? I think, I think describing it. Yeah, okay. So um, back in the 70s, somebody got money from the state of California to take a van and put a motion picture camera on the front and have it triggered by the wheel. Same thing. Um, and uh, I think it was one from every... Lot, right? they... No, this was the state. It was the yeah. And they hired a guy to drive up and down every highway, a state highway in California. And when he was done, four years went by and he started to get it. Same guy. I talked I, I talk with him. And you could go to an office where they had 35 millimeter moviolas uh, to, uh, to, to look manually at this 35 millimeter film and like say, oh, I want to go to the corner of El, El Camino and uh, University, you know, uh, Avenue in Palo Alto. Um, so so we, we looked at that and took a good mile of that and put it up. So we were not the first to do that, by the way. That was California well, taxpayer money. Date of that? Um, well, it was several cycles, but it began in the 70s. So that's preceding the, uh, Aspen. Aspen. Yeah. Oh, my God. That, yeah, that's probably the... Too much credit. Sorry, <laughs> I, can't, I can't accept it. So it's getting to be uh, yeah. nine thirty. I bet some people go to sleep even at night. So, um, and so it's wonderful to have all of you here. If there's one last comment somebody needs to make, I don't want to stop that. But other than that, we have some more crew guys. We can even take them home. And please stay for stay for a bit and discuss things with each other. And thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. I had uh, one. Oh, okay. Thank you, Ted. Thank you. Uh -huh. Oh, uh, next month we're probably going to have James Landing from Stanford. Thanks for coming. Yes, that's good. 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 You can talk right over here. Yeah. Yeah. Because I copied your participation too for the intro. The music video that that stole from that.